welcome back to another show. Today I'm doing a two-hander, Richard Fleischer double-hander. Um, we have the Vikings and Fantastic Voyage. This is the second time I try to do this one. It's not recording the first time, so I'm actually... Uh, this will probably be a, a, a quicker version of what I did said. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It just suddenly... St- I went to turn it off and it stopped already. And then I looked back and it was like... We just recorded the first few minutes. The worst bits. So, um, okay, we'll start again. <laughs> right, um, the Vikings is a lot of fun. The Vikings, it's a double bill of Richard Fleischer. Richard Fleischer did a lot of films in his career. Some good, some bad, some absolutely terrible. Right, he did 2000 Guns of the Sea very early on. He did a film called Narrow Margin, it's a very acclaimed thriller. He did stuff like this, which is the Vikings or Fantastic Voyage, you know. He also did some uh, smaller films like um, Ten Relics in Place and New Centurions, which is a terrific film about um, police starring Stacey Keach and George e. Scott. Later in his career, he also did stuff like Mandingo and Conan the Destroyer and Red Sonja, which were notoriously bad films. And he did a lot of Devil De Laurentiis films later in his career and didn't help either of their careers very much because I, I, he pretty much finished after in mid 80s as a director, he was done. But he had a good run and there was a lot of films. There was obviously some films he cared about and some films he didn't. That's the big thing. Some things from the boys' own adventures and some of them were stuff he really cared about. The big thing about these two films, both are too long. That's a big problem with both of them. They're too long, they're too unwieldy in that area it's just like it's like come on just get to the point quicker is a big thing i mean the vikings the one thing i say the vikings is you don't need the first 10 minutes <laughs> there's a first 10 minutes of a subplot could have, could have been done in a whole minute in a flashback quite easily and it would have been fine explaining the the origins of tony curtis could have done in a minute Instead they set this whole thing up, have it run through all the film, it slows the film down constantly, and it's like, you don't need this. This could have come up later, and it would have been fine, and it's kind of ridiculous. In all films like that, there's lots of scenes that go on for a bit that you don't need. So it's an hour and a half, it's a shipping hour and a half film, but it's two hours. It's that kind of film. I mean, Fantastic Voyage is hour 14, it should be hour 30. Both of the films just should be an hour and a half long. That's the big thing about them. They should just be a certain time, and that's it. But the films themselves are enjoyable. Um, the the big thing is, the thing that Vikings has, which the Vikings is a film I would... Produced by Kirk Douglas when he was making films as a producer. Like he produced Parts of Globe at the same time. He would produce Spartacus later. He was a big producer, a big actor at the time. And that's the part where he, he can rip apart with his spare teeth. He's a total animal in this film. And a horrible character. This character is awful throughout it. He is a rapist. He is the worst of the worst. Full of stuff you can never do in a film nowadays. You know. And I mean, it was mid 80s with him and Mel Gibson. Because it's the same thing of t- self torture self mutilation Like, like Kurt Douglas loses his eye in the first couple of minutes. Because of a hawk attacks on the hawk that belonged to Tony Curtis, who was a slave. And then Tony Curtis loses a hand later on. And then this Borgerdine is, is thrown to mad dogs. There's a lots of violence for films at PG. But it's implied more than seen. But it's way over the top. It's just wonderful. It's way over the top. <laughs> and, you know, the film is way too long. But it's like, there's those kind of things that keep you going. There's lots of atmosphere. It was shot by Jack Cardiff. There's some wonderful atmosphere of going through the fog. The the um, it was shot in Croatia and France, I think, and so you got a lot of old European landscapes that look really good, and they built their Viking stuff on them, and it looks great. It looks gorgeous throughout. The, the ships look great. Everything looks wonderful, but it's very much fake because you've got people like Tony Curtis playing Viking. <laughs> But he works fine though, because it's like, it's because everyone else is a bit Hollywood and fake. It doesn't matter. If you Ernest Borgenine as a Viking Lord Ragnar, that's, yeah, that's, he's the same age as Kurt Douglas in real life, but he's playing his father. And Kurt Douglas is this 
masochist who's in love with Janet Lee, even though she hates him. She despises him. She didn't want him to touch her at all. He's in love with her. And he, he's just... It's just this weird, perverted performance. Again, we never get away with now. But then it seemed reasonable because he's a Viking, so Kirk was simply a total psychopath. And he could be one of the heroes of the film, as long as Tony Kirk kills him at the end. Because Tony Kirk is losing his hand two thirds of the way through, so they're having a fight at the end on this English castle. You know, Tony Kirk with one hand, um, Kirk Douglas with one eye, and they're both they're half brothers because Tony Kirk was, um, was born out of rape of his mother by Ragnar. Yeah, it's that kind of film. It's full of either rape or attempted rape. But it's a PG. It's a boys' own film that is always in t- always always on TV. When I was a kid. It's like, ah, fine. It's like now you look like go, ooh, dodgy, <laughs> very dodgy. The whole film's like that. <laughs> it's full of stuff. It's like now did you go, ooh? I mean, they drink so much. But the actors are having a whale of a time. Kurt Douglas and Bernice Bosnian are just going way over the top. Way, 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 way over the top. In a wonderful way. The Vikings are all holiday extras, but they're all having a great time. Like, no one actually looks like Viking, but they all seem to work quite nicely as these extras. I mean, I think they plug out European actors to play in the background, but they all are pretty up like Hollywood. So that's the way it goes. But the whole thing is just ridiculous. But they pull it off because they're the director and a star who know what they're doing. And they've got these wonderful scenes going through fog with the Viking ships. And you've got all these like fight scenes that are just enjoyable. Everyone's very athletic and silly. You know, it's in no way a realistic Viking movie in any possible way. But it just chugs along really nicely. Despite the fact there's always scenes that could you could lose. That you could lose first 10 minutes and most of the subplot of um, Tweak Archie's past I just refer back to once in a while you'll be fine. Janet Lee turns up as the person that gets kidnapped and she does well for what she's given which is not much. She just has to be the person caught between a total psychopath and Tony Curtis who's the straight man of the film he has to keep the straight line forward of the film going forward and let everyone else overact, which does fine. Not his best performance, not his worst. He was another better film was written about this, like Sweet Smell Success. He's an underrated actor. But he was at a time where people like Marlon Brando and Gummery Cliff, then Paul Newman coming up that were much more method actors, so Curtis was viewed as a lightweight in comparison to them. Because he's much more of a Cary Grant mode. So all this stuff happens. And all this action happens, and there's an action scene every so often, and then there's other scenes of Douglas being drunk and doing some really stupid stuff. <laughs> the rest of the film. It's a wonderfully absurd film, but it should have been an hour and a half. There's, it really should have. There is a good end battle, though, when they, they, they siege the castle of the, the English king and attack it, and end up killing him and feeding him to his dogs. Yeah, and it turns out that, uh, that Tony Curtis is actually the heir to the English throne. That's how absurd the film is. He was sent away as a child, so his cruel uncle wouldn't kill him. He was kidnapped. His, his boat was kidnapped by the Viking who grew up a slave. But he was, but he had a little locket, which somehow he always kept with him, even though the Vikings would probably looked at the locket and stole it instantly. <laughs> it's, it's that kind of stupidity in the film, but. There you go. Still a lot of fun. Still really enjoyable. Um, but uh, now we have Fantastic Voyage. Fantastic Voyage is a... Uh, it's a silly, silly film. It's a silly film that doesn't admit it's a silly film, but it is a silly film. It is, it's, quite, it's a shorter film, so it does feel more enjoyable than the Vikings, because it, it gets to the point quicker. But you do have a a half hour sex in the beginning where they have to set it all up, miniaturise them, get them into the body of the person they're trying to save. Which is about 10 minutes too long because you have a lot of character actors yapping and exposition each other in a bland setting. I was pretty much interesting dialogue, really. But it's panned out so there's only so much money to spend special effects. So if they pad this bit out, so it's the bit that's the hardest to get through. 
but it's still enjoyable enough because because of lots of little toys you can look at. But it's just the the actors aren't great apart from Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance plays the the villain who's secretly working for the Russians, who's managed to be overacted and underacted at the same time. Like he's meant to be subtle, manipulating people, but Donald Pleasance is overdoing it in a wonderful way. So he's the best part of the film, <laughs> having the effects of the thing you watch fortune for. But it's like, you'd be caught in two minutes as a spy, because it's like so obvious he's a villain. There's other characters involved, like the pilot, who's an actor you, I'm sure you've I've seen a million things from the 60s, but I can't recognise a name. You have Stephen Boyd as a hero who's a bit bland. You know, he's no Tony Curtis for a lot getting through the plot, simply. You know, he doesn't have that kind of charm to him. But he does, he keeps it running, but you can remember a bit of lead. Sophia Loren is the uh, leading lady, she's a scientist, yep, scientist is, yeah. It's an excuse to have her in her, in her underwear and swimming through blood particles. She has to explain all these blood things, which is absurd. And finally you've got a scientist who's a religious freak, who's, who think maybe be the traitor, but he's not, he's so obviously not. But he's lots of the potential speeches in the film, whenever they have to slow the film down for two minutes before they get to the next action scene. He has a dialogue about God or something. Which you get a lot of these cheesy sci-fi films in the 60s. It's just one of the conventions. But what we're really there for is the little little submarine and a human body trying to get through the body. That's what they're for and it looks gorgeous. It's nothing to do with a real human body. It looks more psychedelic than anything. Like someone's been has dropped acid before they started watching the film. <laughs> you know, that's what it feels like. It's wonderful, but it's just, it does not feel like a human body at all. Even the bit that they're through the heart does not feel like a heart at all, but it works wonderfully because it's a wonderfully retro film. And there's wonderful stuff that they, they have to go through these streams of blood, but the pressure makes it much harder to control. So they're, so they're, they're getting banged about and of course the blood vessels, and they have to go through the inner ear at some point, and someone drops some scissors on the floor, which causes a, a sound quake. And you have to avoid the antibacteria of the uh, of the, the guy's body who's fighting back against them. It's just wonderfully daft and just great. You know, it's silly as hell, but it's wonderfully enjoyable. It's a good afternoon film to sit back and enjoy and don't take too seriously. Both of them are good throwback to the 50s and 60s Hollywood films. We know, we're still making films they thought were for the fair family that they were silly, but they would never admit they were silly. Like they thought they were making a serious film, even though they weren't, because the premise of Fantastic Voyage is ridiculous. It's not a patch on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as a film, but it's still really enjoyable. You know, it's still a, a well-crafted bit of hokum, but it's really silly. It's not as good as Honey, I the Kids, which is a better film on this subject of miniaturization, which is a silly premise, but Honey, I the kids had humour, which this one doesn't really have. But it still has that old-fashioned craftsmanship that really works. So that's my Richard Fleischer double bell. I hope you enjoyed it. It's a, basically a very minor video. I just thought it'd be fun to point out both these films, saying go watch them. They're really fun and really silly and really enjoyable. And they are... They're not in the same league as New Centurions or something like that, which is one of the Fleischer films that he really cared about, but... For films that was made like as a craftsman, they are very well made. Well, bye for now, I hope you enjoyed it.